Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and Dan. Today is our last episode of the Pandemic Profiteers. Boy, it's been an interesting couple of months, hasn't it? Oh yeah, this has been a real fun series. And I think we're gonna end on a good note here. So let's talk about our final Pandemic Profiteer. And that is this young lady right here. Barbara Lowe Fisher, who made one point, almost $3 million uh, putting out anti-vax uh, disinformation. But she actually had an inadvertent positive role in all of this, didn't she, Dan? Yeah, her story is actually really interesting. Okay, so well, let's talk about her a bit. Apparently, the way she got started in this anti-vaccine road that she's on is that she thought that her son suffered an adverse event from the DPT vaccine, the diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus vaccine. And after writing a book in 1985, she claims to have helped, and she apparently did help uh, get the whole National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program started in the U.S. following the Vaccine Injury Act of 1986. So her book yeah. came out in 1985. Um, now, people are indeed injured by vaccinations, aren't they? It is rare, but it does happen, yes. Yeah. So there are real injuries. Uh, and the other thing that we were talking about just before we got started here is bad things happen to good people sometimes uh, for random reasons. Mm -hmm. And if those random reasons and those bad things happen in some proximity to another event in their life, uh, be it a vaccination or a broken leg or a dose of antibiotics, uh, it's very easy to try and associate the two. Uh, but they're not really always associated, are they, Dan? No, they're not. There's the concept of causation and coincidence. And simply because two things happen uh, in close proximity to each other doesn't necessarily mean one caused the other. Uh, I think this is probably a really good time to talk about something that's very near and dear to my life, and that is the vaccine compensation program. Why don't we take a few minutes and talk about this very important program? So, what do you what do you have to say about it? Uh, you want to you want to kind of walk us through it? Yeah, definitely. So, the way it kind of got started was um, around this concern that Barbara had that the DPT vaccine was causing injuries in children, um, specifically encephalitis. This belief was pretty widespread at the time. So a lot of parents were feeling like if their child suffered encephalitis or something like it, they would think that it was due to the DPT vaccine. And so they, a lot of people were suing pharmaceutical companies because mm -hmm. they thought that that was what caused it. So the pharmaceutical companies who already don't make a ton of money off of vaccines said, okay, this is costing us too much money in legal fees. We're just going to stop making it. Yes. So at that point, the government had to step in and say, no, we need a DPT vaccine. You guys need to keep making it here. We'll set up this national uh, vaccine injury compensation program so that we handle all of the lawsuits coming from people who think that their children are injured by vaccines. And then now, you guys just make it. Now, basically, the vaccine injury fund is is funded by an insurance policy. I mean, we all buy insurance on our cars, on our houses, on our health, on our life. Uh, and the reason that we have insurance programs is that we want to have a fund together in case of an emergency. So what happened was they set this up so that for every vaccination that you got, the vaccine manufacturer had to pay 25 cents. And that was per vaccine. So if you get a trivalent flu vaccine or a DPT, those are three different vaccinations in one shot. That's 75 cents that goes into the fund. And that fund exists to compensate people that have injuries as a result of that. So if you have a true injury due to a vaccine, you're compensated. And unlike regular court cases where you have attorneys bringing court cases for contingency, you know, they get a third of the judgment, for example, the vaccine injury court pays 
for your attorney and it's on a schedule. So they pay your attorney whether they win or lose. Uh, and anything that is comes out as far as compensation from the fund goes to you because your attorney's already paid for. The other mm -hmm. thing is you don't have to prove an injury. Uh, for example, um, flu vaccines uh, have got something called a table of conditions. And on that table of conditions, uh, you have things like brachial plexus injuries to your arm from the injection. You have things like Guillain-Barre syndrome. If you can document that you had any of these conditions in proximity to a flu vaccine, the vaccine is presumed to be guilty. They just write mm -hmm. you a check. The only thing that you really have to make a case for is how badly you were injured. And I've pulled up um, one of the vaccine injury lawyers out here, and you know the average compensation is on the order of $130,000. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's something that requires long-term care or you have a death or something like that, the compensation, of course, is higher. But they're pretty generous with it. And one of the things uh, that I have always maintained is if you have any suspicion whatsoever that you have a vaccine injury, you lose nothing by talking to a vaccine injury lawyer because you may actually have something that's on the on the table and you may get compensated for any for the inconvenience of having some sort of adverse effect for a vaccine you know if you take a covid shot and you feel like crap the next day and then you recover that's not going to really do do you much good but if you have Guillain-Barre or you have an arm injury or you have anything else that's on any of those tables and that lawyer will be able to tell you what's on the table, you lose nothing by putting in a compensation claim and they compensate you. It's as simple as that. Nobody's hiding anything here. So it's not necessarily the most scientific court or ruling system. No. Even though anti-vaxxers try to use it as such. But what it is, it's a really, really important service to those rare, genuine vaccine adverse events, because right. they can happen. And when that does happen, that patient does deserve to be compensated and Absolutely. taken care of properly. Yeah. Absolutely. So if Barbara Lowe Fisher had a hand in starting that, then she absolutely is a blind squirrel that found a nut. Yeah. She did I mean, a good Good thing. on her. Good on her. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've, we've spent weeks now going over the horrendous things that the, these 12 people are doing. And I'm very glad that in our final episode here, we can sit down and talk about somebody that blundered into a good thing. And I think she's one of them. So what else do we have uh, from her that we at least need to be aware of? When you have a child or anybody else that claims an injury due to a vaccine as professionals, you know, me as a physician, you as a molecular biologist, we owe it to that person to take those claims seriously. And I yes. don't think that there's anybody in our professions out there that would deliberately go around saying, oh, vaccine injury, ha, right, and not look into it or treat the parent badly because they had a problem with their child. I have a son mm -hmm. that's on the spectrum, all right? Uh, not everybody knows that, but I've got a son that's on the spectrum. He was on the spectrum you know, just a couple of years after Wakefield came out. So there's always that question, you know, did it have something to do with the vaccine? And I started looking into it like a concerned parent. And I found that there's no known cause for autism. And if there's no known cause for autism, how can I, how can I say in honesty that I know that the vaccine caused it? I don't know what caused mm -hmm. autism. I don't know if it's the 15th chromosome. I don't know if it's one of the other things that have been floated around. My son still was on the spectrum and he needed services and we made sure that he got the services. Mm -hmm. You know, bad things happen to good people. And uh, fortunately now he's doing well. He's down, at, you know, he, he graduated from Clemson and he's in computer science right now, a great field for him. Uh, and things turned out pretty well for him. And that's good. I'm proud of that. I did not approach it from trying to figure out how this was not my fault. I need something to blame this on. I guess that maybe set me a little different than some of the people that are in the anti-vax movement because they seem to desperately want something to blame. 
Sure. And that's, it's completely natural to want that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in your story, I, um, I think, I think it sounds like what helped your son a lot was receiving that diagnosis. Someone yes. figuring out, yes, this is the case. He's on the spectrum. Let's get him the services that he needs. Let's right. make sure that, you know, we educate ourselves about where he is on the spectrum and how best to assist him. And it's the same with really any condition or illness that someone is going through. Today, you have things going viral on the internet about this person or that claiming that they're injured by COVID vaccines. Whenever I see a story like that online, if there's no relevant information, I just say, you know, this person, for all I know, could very well have been injured by the mm -hmm. COVID vaccine. But oftentimes, they say they don't know what's wrong with them. And in that case, I, 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 if I do talk to that person, I tell them, what you need is a doctor who will listen to you and be able to diagnose what is wrong with you. Because once you find out what your condition is, then you can start to find out if there are treatment options and actually start to get better. Yeah. But instead, I think a lot of those people are swept up into this agenda that a lot of anti-vaxxers have to use people who may or may not be injured by a vaccine in their own personal monetary or political gains. And that yeah. does not help that patient. No. Telling that patient that they're vaccine injured and that they have to fight this fight against COVID vaccines, that doesn't help them. What they need is a diagnosis. They need a treatment plan. And they do deserve to be compensated. Yes. That's what's going to help these people. Well, one of the things that we talked about a couple of times ago, and that is the blood clotting uh, that's been, quote unquote, associated with um, the COVID vaccine. Now, there were blood clots associated with COVID. However, decidual mm -hmm. casts and all these other horrendous things, you know, reports from embalmers and things like that. Those are not necessarily related to COVID. Uh, some of them are actual natural processes. And, you know, if I, if I go on out and I get a COVID shot, all of a sudden I'm fatigued and I have bruising everywhere. Okay. It's very tempting, uh, especially if I'm somebody that can be easily manipulated by things I read and, and listen to on YouTube. You know, I could be contacting this guy and he says, look at all these bruising and, you know, I've got no energy anywhere. And... You know, I'm vaccine injured and, you know, I could be I could be paraded in front of Congress or in front of rallies as a mm -hmm. as a typical, you know, uh, a typical guy that got vaccine injured. But I think that the approach that I would take would be I would probably go see a doctor. I'd really like to know if I had leukemia before I went out, and became a public figure in the face of vaccine injury. A lot of the people that are in the anti-vax movement have a basic mistrust of healthcare professionals. At least I think they do because the doctor recommends a vaccine and you know, they read all this stuff or heard about it on YouTube. So they, it really undermines your faith in doctors. But if you have a true vaccine injury, the key to it is getting into your family doctor and getting a diagnosis. Let's find mm -hmm. out what's going on and sooner rather than later. Because, you know, at, at the very, you know, think of the best case scenario. Uh, you do have a vaccine injury. Let's get it documented so that there's no question about, you know, okay, well, I got a vaccine and three years later, you know, I grew, I grew a word on my nose. Okay, well, so what? You know, if you have Guillain-Barre, get it diagnosed. And right. then your case is very strong and they will write you a freaking check. To compensate you for your inconvenience and not only all that but getting it getting that diagnosis not only helps the patient it helps everybody because guess what mm -hmm. if that is a true vaccine injury if the vaccine actually caused that condition then we want to know about it yeah and guess what there will be more people getting diagnosed with that condition vaccine safety monitoring programs are very sensitive when mm -hmm. the J and J COVID vaccine rolled out. They detected six cases of serious blood clots in six million doses. 
that is very sensitive. So if yep. there was an uptick in diagnoses for a genuine vaccine cause effect, then that would get noticed. And we would yes. then be able to say, yep. okay, this vaccine does cause this and we need to be aware of it. And we need yep. to then weigh the risk analysis. Yep. So get that diagnosis. Yeah. You know, if you're if you're a, a young person, one of the big things that they're talking about is they're finding an increased incidence of myocarditis, all right? Mm -hmm. Or what they're calling an increased incidence. Those were picked up by Veras. Mm -hmm. And those were picked up in patients that have a known rate of getting viral myocarditis. And, you know, the key to that is most of it is from viral illness. And mm -hmm. you need professionals looking at this data and evaluating it and following it up as needed. And that is what the entire system is built around. And that's a good thing. We don't monitor mm -hmm. these things on YouTube. We monitor these right. things by people who actually do this for a living. All right. And don't have a dog in the fight. You know, I don't get extra points for diagnosing you with diabetes. But you know something? Mm -hmm. You're going to do a lot better if I find out you do have diabetes and start treating it. Right. Uh, you know, I'm not glad you have the disease, but I'm really glad that we know you have it because then we can do something about it. Right. Same, same thing with vaccine injuries. So on that positive note, get your vaccinations. If you have any issues at all and you, you feel that you may have had a vaccine injury, get it diagnosed. And if you do have something uh, that you were diagnosed with immediately after a vaccination, look into it. If you have any questions about it, contact me. I will put you in touch with attorneys that do nothing but this. You know, we're not trying to hide anything here. The reason, the entire purpose that Dr. Dan and I went through all of this work to put this series together for you is to show you where an awful lot of this information is coming from and why it's being put out there. And between the two of us, you've got an awful lot of education here trying to give you the correct information and why it's correct. Um, I was very glad to have Dr. Dan with us. Um, I'm a long ways out of my primary sciences, and that's what he does for a living. Um, likewise, uh, he's a long way from clinical medicine, and that's what I do for a living. So, Dan, what do you, how do you want to end out this series? What would you like to say to the audience? You know, I'll just say I hope that this has been informative to anyone who has been watching. Um, I hope that it's given you some tools to, in the future, maybe suss out mm -hmm who might be a next pandemic profiteer and who might be talking legitimate science because it's really important for the public to be able to figure that out. You know, Bob and I can do our best to help you, but really what we want is for people to be able to think for themselves. And so I hope that this has been that for you. And I appreciate you all watching. Our, our job here was not to give you an opinion. Our job here was to give you tools to come up with your own opinion. Well, where to from here, Dan? What are, you, what are you thinking about? We talked about a potential topic for the future. I think after a little break, we can definitely tackle it. So if you want to see Dr. Dan and I get together again and maybe uh, kind of go down this road a little bit more, put a comment underneath the uh, video here and let us know. Uh, make sure you take a moment, go over to his channel, have a look at some of his work. His approach is a little bit different than mine, and he covers subjects that I don't cover. Uh, I think that you would en enjoy seeing what he has. Uh, I always have, because I, I watch his channel on a regular basis, because I, I learn something from him every day. So in any event, this is Bob the Science Guy, signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you again for stopping by. I hope that this gave you some useful tools for your, uh, for your toolbox there. And remember, don't take any wooden nickels, and just because it's on YouTube doesn't mean it's true. Unless, of course, Dr. Dan and I are in it. Oh
the science guy.